Travis Williams, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet y'all virtually. Um, I'm a physiatrist or physical medicine and rehabilitation physician here. Our clinic is Idaho Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I'm going to start sharing my screen here as we get going here, and uh, we'll get into our lecture. We have a pretty big topic to discuss today, and so I'm going to try my best to get it done here in very abbreviated time. I did tell Shannon that uh, my slides would be available via PDF if anybody wants to refer to this. Some of the initial things um, are good for reference, but hopefully it can um, promote some discussion here. So um, just a few objectives that we have for today. Let's see if I can get my, there we go. A little delay here. First, I have no financial disclosures or interest uh, to disclose today. Here are our objectives. We're going to briefly review basic physiology of neurotransmitter pathways and focus on six types of neurotransmitters that are going to help us as we discuss some of the pharmacology involved in severe traumatic brain injury. And then a bulk of our discussion is going to be primarily reviewing medications that can impact this neurotransmitter pathway and then discuss some evidence um, at least the evidence that exists for neuropharmacological medications in severe traumatic brain injury. So just to recap, this is some basic physiology and we won't go in depth here, but there are over a hundred different neurotransmitters in our brain. And the six prominent neurotransmitters that we want to focus on and that are most applicable for our discussion today are acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and GABA and glutamate. Histamine gets an honorable mention, but we won't focus much uh, in that arena there. Uh, some brief uh, highlights that I want to go with each of these slides. They're busy slides, so please go back and refer to them if you choose to. But um, acetylcholine has uh, really th three major areas um, in traumatic brain injury that we're going to focus on. Uh, arousal, attention, and long-term memory. Dopamine is um, kind of a complex neurotransmitter. It's focused in a lot of different things. It's producing the substantia nigra. Um, there are multiple pathways. So the mesocortical pathway is the one that we're probably most interested in, and that focuses on cognitive and executive func functions. The nigrostriatal pathway is for motor planning. Um, and so those are the two primary ones that we're going to focus on as we address our um, medications here. So a, a brief pictogram here for the mesocortical system Notice where it is anatomically in the brain, and it affects, as I mentioned earlier, cognition, executive functions, emotions, and affect. And then the nigrostriatal pathway is in the substantia nigra, basal ganglia, deeper in the brain, and this is with the motor movements. Norepinephrine is the next one. Um, it, it acts on alpha and beta receptors. Its primary role is in vigilance, attention, and arousal. Serotonin or 5-HT, uh, it's involved in multiple processes, autonomic function, motor activity, hormone secretion, cognition, affect, emotion, and re reward. And then GABA is uh, the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. We have GABA-A and GABA-B receptors. Most of the medications uh, focus on the GABA-A Baclofen, one of the medications we'll discuss later on, is um, helpful in targeting uh, GABA-B receptors. Glutamate is the opposite so principal excitatory neuron, and its uh, focus is primarily learning and memory. Interestingly, in the first seven days after a traumatic brain injury, there's a hypothesis that it has an excitotoxic effect, so an increase in glutamate here. And to demonstrate that glutamate pathways are involved in multiple areas throughout the brain. Okay, so with that as just kind of a brief background, that will help guide our discussion as we turn on to pharmacological intervention. So I wish that I was here to present some brand new brain injury drug. You know, we have a, if someone has hypertension, we go and we can administer antihypertensive and we can see results. We don't have that in brain injury, uh, as nice as it would be, but we have multiple medications. Many of you are probably familiar with some of these medications, and I'd like to focus on how they might apply to uh, patients with severe traumatic brain injury. So some of the general principles when we're talking about pharmacology was we need, a, we need to focus on the needs of the individual patient. There's not one brain injury patient. There's not one severe brain injury patient. As you'll see, there are multiple different areas that we're going to address, and we need to make sure that we're assessing their needs. 
my general principle when I'm prescribing medication in any form is to start low and go slow. And that's the same with uh, brain injury. We want to make sure that we find the right therapeutic window and the least, the lowest dose possible to give that therapeutic when the therapeutic response. Um, it's important that we monitor medication slowly. Now, some of these severe traumatic brain injury patients are going to be seen initially in the hospital, and it's a lot easier to monitor these medications. Uh, but in the outpatient setting, we need to have some type of frequency as we're titrating medications to make sure we're getting the right response. This is focused on medications today, but sometimes medications are the problem. So sometimes the right answer is eliminating medications rather than adding medications. And I generally try to avoid doing both at the same time. So I would either eliminate a medication or start a medication and then monitor response. And because this is on pharmacology and medications, that's going to be the primary focus of my talk. However, there may be non-pharmacological intervention. And it sounds like last week there was a discussion on that. And so those principles apply and uh, environment and, and certain different things that are going to impact the patient's behavior are important things to address first. Um, here are five major areas that I wanna discuss in our uh, management of medications. So there's agitation, irritability, and aggression. The opposite would be hypoarousal, insomnia, spasticity, attention, and memory. Now, spasticity is kind of one of those that's a little bit different. It's not focused on the neurocognitive component. I've saved that actually for the end uh, if we have time to discuss it because I think it impacts overall function and can lead to and impact some of these other areas. So starting off with agitation, irritability, and aggression. These are classes of medications or specific medications that we're going to review. Beta blockers have some good evidence, and I'm going to give a caveat at the very beginning. The evidence that we have is actually small. So a lot of these are going to be small case studies, or the number of people that they studied are not, not very robust. And so we have to take that with a grain of salt. They've done a lot of things to try to amp this up with meta-analyses, but um, what I'm going to present, the, the evidence is, is quite small. But my references are at the end if you'd like to see more in depth on, on where these come from. But propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker. And in some of these small studies, they noted that the maximum intensity of agitated episodes was greatly reduced. This was a meta-analysis done. Um, but notice that the doses that they used were up to 420 milligrams daily. Pretty robust dose in propranolol. However, we can see when patients are agitated, this is a non-habit forming medication that Unless they have cardiovascular side effects or contraindications, it's a relatively safe medicine to start, and we can see some good uh, results at reducing some of the agitation or um, hyperarousal. Amantadine, if I were to say there was a brain injury drug, this is probably as close as it can be. We use it commonly in brain injury. It's a dopamine agonist and a weak NMDA uh, antagonist. There are a couple of different uh, areas where we're going to present amantadine today. Uh, in this, for hyperarousal or for aggression or irritation or agitation, Dr. Hammond and her colleagues in 2015, they found that 100 milligrams dose twice a day resulted in significant reduction in frequency and severity of um, the irritability in patients. It has some cognitive benefits that we'll discuss a little later on. One thing that I wanted to mention is um, how we perceive agitation. So akathisia is a motor restlessness. And sometimes if you've seen these patients in the hospital or even outside of the hospital, they, they can't sit still. They're always doing something and, and their, their hands are moving, their legs are moving. And uh, some people would classify this as agitation. They're not really agitated. They just have this motor restlessness. So because amantadine is a dopamine agonist, it actually, through that nigrostriatal pathway we discussed, can calm down the akathisia. So um, in addition to someone who truly is irritable or agitated, this may help with um, the akathisia portion. The big thing is that um, amantadine is not dialyzable. And so we want to be cautioned in patients that have renal disease. And there are some other things that, um, that happen if we uh, have increased levels, such as hallucinations, coma. But at the dose of 100 milligram twice a day, it generally works uh, fairly well. Now, this is a somewhat of a stimulant. And so I generally dose this at breakfast and lunch and not uh, twice a day, a, a typical twice daily dosing for breakfast and dinner. Anti-epileptics are another class of medication. This um, 
you'll find a lot too, many of you have a behavioral health background that there's severe traumatic brain injury and some of the um, behavioral health diagnoses tend to behave similarly. And so a lot of the medications can be similar in this. Um, so for um, anti-epileptics, valproic acid, divalproax, carbamazepine, um, lamictal, a lot of these medications can be helpful at calming down or, or stabilizing the mood of these patients. There was a, a small case series of 29 patients where they were agitated and had received benzodiazepines and they didn't control the agitation. So they switched to Divalproex. And of those, you can see the results here that there was a noted improvement or resolution of symptoms um, based on just a, a switch to this medication. Some contraindications or cautions, there are some severe uh, cautions or contraindications with these medications. And a lot of these require dosing or, or managing uh, medication levels. Now, um, that's convenient when we're in the hospital or convenient if we're set up to do that, but um, it's something we should be aware of. Now, we may reach therapeutic effect from a clinical standpoint before we even reach uh, therapeutic effect from a lab level. So we want to make sure we're treating the patient and not the lab, but we certainly don't want our medication levels to be supra therapeutic uh, for patient safety. Antipsychotics. So remember, there are typical and atypical antipsychotics. Uh, Haldol or haloperidol is a typical antipsychotic. It gets a bad rap in a lot of reasons because it has high affinity for the D2, uh, the dopamine 2 uh, receptor. And so it can cause uh, both cognitive and extrapyramidal adverse events. In TBI, they found that there were some prolonged cognitive changes in using Haldol. And so it's generally accepted that we don't use Haldol with our traumatic brain injury patients. And really in general, we try to avoid medications that would have significant cognitive impacts for these patients because there's typically cognitive delays that we want to minimize. The atypical antipsychotics, quetiapine, zeprazidone, olanzapine, those um, have less of a dopaminergic effect, um, especially on the D2 receptor. So um, there was a small study um, with Kim and colleagues in 2006, and then another case series that found that using these atypical antipsychotics were helpful in reducing uh, some of their uh, agitation scale and in improving neurological function. Now, ziprazidone and olanzapine also have um, intermuscular formulations, and there are some times when it's appropriate for use of intermuscular medications. If a patient is at risk of hurting themselves, hurting others, uh, if they have tubes or lines, a lot of these patients have G-tubes or trachs or other things that if, um, if needed, we need to help sedate them um, quickly rather than waiting for medication. There are some cautions that we need to be aware of, but overall, this is one of the go-to medications at helping with uh, agitation, especially in the acute inpatient setting and can be stabilizing uh, in moving forward. Benzodiazepines, as I mentioned before, because of their impact on coordination, cognition, and memory, we try to avoid those. Would you be wrong in using an, an acute intramuscular benzo? No, you would not um, if a patient was at risk of hurting themselves, but generally we try to avoid this class of medications. So briefly, these are certainly not an inclusive list, but beta blockers, amanadine, anti-epileptics, antipsychotics are the primary four that we should consider at least um, in managing agitation. Okay, the opposite of agitation is hypoarousal. Now, primarily we're looking at dopamine, but also some of these other neurotransmitters as well. Um, amantadine shows up again um, when we're trying to wake patients up. This is sort of the stimulant portion of that. Um, Dr. Giacino in 2012 did a 184 patient uh, placebo controlled trial, and he found that at 100, 100 to 200 milligrams twice daily, that there was an improved rate of recovery based on this disability rating scale. Um, and so it's, it's often a medication that can have multifaceted benefits here. Methylphenidate. So it, it primarily works by blocking the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. So it can improve alertness, improve attention. Um, there was a meta-analysis that was done that said it didn't have any long-term effects on memory or processing speed. 
However, Dr. Zafont and McAllister did present some evidence of improved uh, processing speed. So if we're trying to wake somebody up, especially in, in hypoaroused uh, patients, the methylphenidate could be another reasonable option. Bromocryptine is a medication we don't typically use, um, but it works primarily on the uh, D2 receptor of dopamine. And at small doses, and this is a start very low and go very slow, but they found that in the 18 patients that they studied, um, that there was uh, improvement overall in waking up. So they started in a coma or vegetative state. And at 18 months, they uh, had two of them, which improved to what uh, therapists call minimum assist. And three of them approved, improved to modified independent as far as their functional level. Now, I know this is a very small series, and I know that time can also be a component of that. But when we're looking deep into the bench here to try to find medications to help people wake up, bromocrypting is a reasonable option to consider if we've trialed these other ones. Modafinil, um, generally, it works similarly, uh, same idea as methylphenidate, but it um, they found as far as in brain injury that it really only improved daytime sleepiness, not really improved uh, on the cognitive side. Okay, insomnia. Dr. Hammond, um, is is one that has been a primary role in, in evidence in brain injury. So you'll see some of her lectures here, uh, some of her studies here. Um, melatonin is a natural substance. So it's responsible for circadian rhythm um, regulation in our body. It's over the counter. Um, it has a low side effect profile. So if we're starting with something, this is a, a good go-to medication. Dr. Grima found that in measuring salivary melatonin levels in healthy versus TBI patients, that there were 42% less overnight melatonin in the TBI patients. So you'll find in the literature three to 10 milligrams, um, three to six is probably more common. And this would be something that could be a small, uh, small medication that could go a long way at helping regulate sleep-wake cycles. Trazodone is uh, in a study found to be the most commonly used medication in traumatic brain injury. It's uh, antidepressant uh, by classification, but it helps in sleep initiation primarily and can help with uh, the different um, maintenance stages of sleep. It uh, generally has a, a minimal side effect profile, but we need to be cautious if we're using other serotonergic medications. Zolpidem, this is one interesting thing that I wanted to um, point out, especially in brain injury. So. It's, it's not something that I generally recommend to use. When they were looking at other op uh, options for treating the insomnia, they tried Zolpidem. And there, were, there are multiple case studies which document this, that patients who were in a vegetative or coma state, that they couldn't communicate, they didn't have any purposeful movements throughout the day, they were not sleeping well, they gave them Zolpidem and the patients woke up at night. So they, they would have um, documented cases where they actually communicated verbally in purposeful communication for several hours with family, and that effect wore off, and uh, they weren't able to achieve that again. But I generally avoid Zolpidem unless we can't find anything else. And there's some newer Z medications that could be considered um, if we're looking in this classification of medications. Um, we're going to skip through here because I know we're getting a little bit short on time here. Attention um, is something that we see a lot. Attention deficits, a lot of acquired attention deficits in patients have had severe traumatic brain injury. So this was uh, mentioned earlier, but in uh, Dr. McAllister and Dr. Zafont did a another small study, 32 patient randomized placebo controlled trial, and they found that with this um, tapering up titrating and then tapering dose that they, there was statistically significant improvement in cognitive symptoms. And there was also improvement in attention and processing speeds. And so this is another evidence. Um, I use methylphenidate on a fair amount and uh, I start at five milligrams and I very slowly work my way up for a desired effect. Sometimes um, if if a little is good, a lot is better, but usually what I find is the lowest dose possible is helpful because the therapeutic response generally um, is patient dependent. Denepazil is, uh, there's some other evidence to help with this. 
There was noted uh, statistically significant improvement in attention and short-term memory. And so uh, it may be something that we would consider in traumatic, severe traumatic brain injury patients. Um, and then I'm briefly going to talk about spasticity as we're coming to an end of my time here. Um, this is not related necessarily to neurocognitive effects. Um, spasticity accompanies most of the patients who have severe traumatic brain injury. Mostly we see a hemiplegia, and it can be significant in contributing to the perceived restlessness or agitation or pain. And so some basic principles, if you're going to initiate therapy, may be helpful. Um, it's, it's briefly defined as a velocity-dependent increase in muscle tone, um, and it basically happens because of a, a deficiency or loss in inhibitory pathways, those descending inhibitory pathways. So baclofen is one of the um, great medications to start with. It is centrally acting, and it may have some uh, cognitive side effects because of that, so we need to be cautious with that. But oftentimes, I get uh, patients sent over to me from primary care and they have, um, they're on five milligrams twice or three times a day and the family or caregivers are wondering why it's not working. So typically um, I increase them pretty quickly and dosing up to 80 milligrams or even hundred milligrams a day and three or four times a day dosing could be helpful. Just remember that um, baclofen withdrawal is uh, life-threatening. And then another just pearl for thought here would be dantrolene. So a lot of people see dantrolene, they think malignant hypothermia. It uh, inhibits calcium release at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but it acts on the muscle. So of all the muscle relaxants that we look at, the dantrolene is the only peripherally acting. So in patients with severe cognitive dysfunction and we want to avoid any centrally acting medications, then dantrolene would be a great option. The only thing that we need to uh, pay attention to is primarily the liver, so a pre- uh, liver check um, with labs would be helpful prior to uh, initiating the medication and then frequent checking of that as we're up titrating doses. And you can dose as high as 100 milligrams three times a day. Generally, I start at 25 milligrams um, twice or three times a day and up titrate from there. Um, there are also injectable therapies, which you'd probably refer to someone like me uh, for managing spasticity. Um, so as we get to the end of this year, um, this was a very, very quick dive into um, some neuropharmacology and severe traumatic brain injury. So let me give you just a few takeaways to highlight what we had here, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, it's complex, okay? Treatment of severe TBI is more than just medication. So a multidisciplinary approach with therapy, with different providers, with caregivers is, is really important. Pharmacotherapy is a key part of that, but we need to make sure that we're treating the needs of the patients. So remember to start low, go slow when we're using medications. We don't want to do any more than one medication at a time if we can avoid that. We may need to reduce medications, but focus overall on the goals that you have. Some of these goals are for patients that can't express their desires. And so the family, patients, uh, caregiver, or others may help us in identifying what those goals may be. And then I'm going to leave my contact information. If you guys have any questions about managing some of these things specifically with regard to severe TBI, please don't hesitate to reach out to your local friendly physiatrist. There are several of us in the area that treat traumatic brain injury. So thank you for letting me spend a little bit of time with you. And if we have time, I will open up for just a few minutes of questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Uh, we did have one question right away in our chat from Dr. Andy Bradbury, who said, any role in agitation for gabapentin or pregabalin? Are other atypicals okay other than those mentioned in the slides? Good question. Um, and agitation aggression, I could probably give you a two-hour lecture on that. There's a lot of things that play into agitation, and one of them is pain. And so there's a lot of neuropathic pain that comes with patients that have severe TBI. And so if we're trying to identify why is the patient agitated, then certainly um, managing that uh, would be appropriate. And also other atypical antipsychotics are, are definitely okay and would follow those guidelines that I would mention earlier. Awesome. And Travis, you're, you're good to stop your share. And we will open it up to everyone. We have a few minutes here for questions. Dr. Williams, you did great on your timing, so thank you. <laughs> so questions from our audience. Uh, 
just one question for me, uh, Neil Reagan, family doctor, Pocatello. Uh, have you noticed any significant issues with an increase in agitation or anxiety using the stimulant meds like methylphenidate? That's a really good question. Um, some people, the short answer is no. Um, I actually did a case presentation a few years ago um, it, with highlighting how we treated agitation and uh, aggression with methylphenidate. Um, and so certainly there could be cases where that would exist, but generally what we see is that because um, the methylphenidate works on helping in inhibitory pathways as well, that it actually improves patients' ability to um, process things and to calm down cognitively, despite the fact that it's a stimulant. One other uh, kind of add on there. I have a number of patients who I see who have had some degree of brain injury, not in the same category of mostly what you're talking about. And I'm wondering, how much of a spectrum disorder this is and how these medications that you've talked about today would apply to my practice. For example, I see a fair number of people with brain injuries who have either diagnosed uh, ADHD or uh, ADHD-like symptoms, uh, have, have a lot of the stuff that you described in terms of symptoms, just not to the extent that your patients do. Yeah. Thank you again. The uh, This is primarily for severe traumatic brain injury, but I probably treat more concussion and mild traumatic brain injury in my clinic than I do severe uh, just by virtue of numbers. And so I always look for those kind of things. If we're going to start a medication that having, um, looking at, were they sort of predisposed to this? Did they have some tendencies for some of this ADHD before then certainly it would be a good medication. I have patients in, with concussion that just a small amount of, of methylphenidate can help if there are some other concurrent uh, psychiatric diagnoses, um, bipolar uh, disorder being one of them, or some mood instability prior to, to brain injury, even just in a concussion, that that can augment sort of those symptoms and using a mood stabilizer would be very appropriate. Great question, Dr. Reagan. Uh, other questions or comments today? Oh, we got one in the chat from Mary Black. Um, issues with hydrocephalus, shunt placement, and usage of these medications. Another great question. Um, generally, no, as far as causing trouble with hydrocephalus, but it's very common to have hydrocephalus and brain injury. And sometimes, and this goes back to the etiology of why a patient is agitated or, or aggressive, and sometimes uh, shunt placement is the key because they do have hydrocephalus. So I don't uh, see uh, causality from medications causing the uh, hydrocephalus, but it is common to see in brain injury. And treating that could be the main difference as far as treating an aggressive or agitated patient. And we have time for one more question if anybody's got one. And thank you for putting your contact info in there. Uh, we'll have Laura add that to our slides that we post to our website so that people have that. Great, one thing I just wanna mention based on my name is there is another Travis Williams who is a DO. He works at St. Luke's and he's an oncologist, a very smart stand-up guy. We get confused all the time because we're both in the Boise area. So my middle initial is J and this is my, my contact information if you wanna reach out. Uh, he would answer a lot of questions for cancer but maybe less so in the brain injury world. Thank you. I think I actually ran into that problem too when I was trying to get you for this talk. So thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> 